100 years since the Titanic, the largest and most luxurious ship of its time, sank in the Atlantic Ocean on a frosty night in 1912. One and a half thousand people died. And the ship itself lay unknown for many decades, at a depth of almost three miles. The Titanic was finally found at the bottom in 1985, thanks to which we can reconstruct the events quite accurately, almost minute by minute. Today we are inviting you on a grandiose voyage. We will try to cross the Atlantic on an incredibly expensive ship, try to get on a lifeboat and answer the question why the Titanic did not reach its destination and why so many victims. First, a brief background. The Titanic was designed by excellent designers, built with the highest quality materials at the time, in one of the best shipyards in the world. And its crew consisted of an incredibly experienced, but not well-coordinated team. It is the very perfection that the human mind and hands were capable of creating, at the beginning of the 20th century. It set sail under the motto, Absolute Unsinkability. But as it happens, no company or shipyard in the world has ever been able to build an unsinkable ship. And here's the unfortunate result. A deserved punishment. For the carelessness of the British Ministry of Trade. The owner's failure to provide the ship with sufficient lifeboats. The deceptive belief in absolute safety. And the unjustifiable risk of traveling at high speed through the icebergs of the Atlantic. It all turned out to be a disaster. In general, the sinking of the Titanic was the result of neglect of duty and self-confidence. Only when the huge ship went to the bottom of the ocean, measures were taken to prevent such a tragedy from happening again. But for 1,500 people, it was too late. But let's take it one step at a time. We should start with how big a ship the Titanic was. We have already said that the disaster is called the wreck of the biggest ship in history, at that point in time. The liner was 269 meters long. Usually in such cases it is customary to compare it with the size of football pitches. So let's do a comparison. So the Titanic was as long as almost three football pitches. And half a football field wide. But perhaps what struck people the most was its height, over 50 meters. It's effectively a modern 10-story house. But did mankind really know no other such ships? At the time of its first and last voyage, the Titanic was indeed the most enormous ship in history. But just a month and a half after the Titanic disaster, Germany launched the liner Emperor, which surpassed the Titanic in all respects. Not by much, but superior. And in general, the beginning of the 20th century was the time of giant ships. Every major country tried to create its own biggest and fastest liner in the world. Which was bound to set records of speed and luxury on it. But today, the size of the Titanic can hardly surprise anyone. One of the largest modern cruise ships, the Symphony of the Seas is about twice the size of the legendary liner. Both in length and height. It can take 5,000 passengers to port. And the Titanic was designed for only 2,500 and that's not counting the ship's crew. Still, the Titanic was indeed one of the most technologically advanced ships when it was built. Let's talk a little bit about why all of a sudden mankind started building such huge ships. So, the 19th century is called the Age of Steam. The Industrial Revolution is unimaginable without the steam engine. It had an incredible impact on progress. Few other human inventions have managed to do the same. Except for electricity, the internet, and the wheel. In general, the steam engine turned out to be a universal means of solving any problem. It was trying to find a use for it. Not only in factories, but also in transport. A steam engine appeared, and then they thought about how to put a steam engine on a ship. After a long series of problems and improvements, the first steamer called Sirius sailed between England and the USA in 1838. It had 35 crew members and 40 passengers on board. 
Sirius, first ship to cross the Atlantic entirely under steam. And at the same time became the first winner of the Atlantic Blue Ribbon. This was the prize for the fastest crossing of the Atlantic Ocean. Soon there were dozens of other ships aiming to get the coveted Blue Ribbon. Titanic wanted it too. The competition was not only between companies, but also between countries. The Americans were offended that the British could make much faster ships. So it became a matter of principle for them to create something similar. So there appeared a whole fleet of flat-bottom steamers, which could take on board 200 passengers. In addition to speed, they offered passengers comfort that no other British ship could offer. The cabins were ventilated, heated. People could wash in the bathroom and then visit the smoking room with other gentlemen. This has all set new standards in the transatlantic crossing industry. Now the perfect ship must not only be fast, but also comfortable. The British, of course, couldn't stay away and decided to build something completely unique. Something that would leave the Americans far behind for years to come. A huge ocean liner. And you know when that happened? In the middle of the 19th century, that is 60 years before the Titanic was built. Therefore, construction of the steamship Great Eastern began in England. It was 211 meters long. For times the length of any other steamship of the time. And the cabins could accommodate 4,000 passengers. If anything, that's nearly twice the maximum capacity of the Titanic. Until the beginning of the 20th century, it was the Great Eastern that held the title of the largest ship in the world. Nothing like it was built for another 12 years, even after the superliner was scrapped. Walking in the waters of the Atlantic, improving the comfort and speed of regular voyages, allowed to transport not only rich traders and industrialists, but also tens of thousands of immigrants to America, leaving Europe. But on most ships of the time, there were a very small number of cabins with relative comforts. Such a voyage was expensive and was only available to the wealthy. Low-income people were condemned to a tedious journey in cramped quarters, cold, dark and damp. It was only much later that conditions for third-class passengers became more tolerable. And since the 70s of the 19th century passenger ships on Atlantic lines begin to turn from ordinary ships, into a hotel on the water. And so we finally find ourselves at the beginning of the 20th century, where in England the White Star Line Company begins to create a new line of giant ships. At the helm of White Star Line was Joseph Bruce's May. For him, shipbuilding and passenger transport across the ocean is a long-standing family business. In 1902, White Star Line is bought by the famous American financier J.P. Morgan, but leaves all of its former management in place. For Ismay, the sale of the family business was not a tragedy. On the contrary, he hoped to use the Morgan money to make White Star Line the largest and most respected shipping company in the world. White Star Line's fleet already consisted of several large and luxurious ships, but all of them lacked good speed. Something fundamentally new was needed. And Joseph Bruce Ismay presented J.P. Morgan with a unique design. A huge ship with a narrow bow that could easily cut through a wave and therefore could move faster than other ships. And its capacity would allow it to recoup the cost of production. The billionaire approved the plan and allocated 1500000 million for the construction of the two liners. Let's not translate that into modern exchange rates, I think you realize that's a lot. The construction of a large seagoing vessel can take several years, and it goes something like this. First, the shipping company analyses what qualities the new ship should have. Speed, size, interior design, and so on. Then it passes the order to the shipyard, where hundreds of designers spend months calculating, making suggestions and drawing plans. Then they build a model a few meters in size on which to test the calculations. And then, after careful checks and modifications, the ship is dry docked. In the end, the first such superliner was the Olympic. It was launched on the 20th of October, 1910. By the way, it will be the only one of the three ships of this series, which will successfully work for several decades and will go to a well-deserved rest. That is, for scrap. 
the main characters of the Olympics' maiden voyage were the same people who would later sail on the Titanic. They are Joseph Bruce's May, the director of the White Star Line, and Edward John Smith, the ship's captain. The Olympic flight to New York went without any problems. And Joseph Bruce Ismay was on board looking for ways to improve future ships of this class. For example, he decided that there was too much space on one of the decks for walking, which nobody used, and therefore it could be used to increase the area of cabins. As a result, the Titanic could take on board 163 more passengers than the Olympic. He gave importance even to little things like the need to install cigar racks in the first-class bathrooms, installing an electric potato peeling machine in the ship's kitchen, which would speed up the work of the cooks many times over. All this appeared on the Titanic, as did expensive wooden furniture instead of wicker, luxurious carpets. After the Olympic arrived in New York, Ismay sent his wife a telegram in which he described the new ship as a miracle. Indeed, the success of the Olympic ship's voyage was so great that soon it became almost impossible to get first-class tickets. By the way, such tickets cost in our money about $50,000 per person one way. On the 31st of May, 1911, when Olympic set sail on her maiden voyage across the Atlantic, Titanic was launched. On the quayside, a crowd of Belfast residents and special guests, including billionaire J.P. Morgan, watched the moment of celebration. White Star Line even hired a special vessel to take all those who wanted to witness the historic moment to Belfast. Ten months after its launch, the Titanic successfully completed trials under the supervision of officials from the UK Department of Trade. The liner spent many hours in the Irish Sea. One of the main people on the deck of the Titanic, at that moment, was Thomas Andrews the managing director of the shipyard where the ship was being built. Thomas Andrews worked there from the age of 16 and worked his way up from apprentice to chief designer. At that time he was one of the best and most respected ship engineers in England, a member of many professional societies, designer of several steamships and so on. He was also the chief designer of the Titanic. After the trials, on Wednesday 3 April 1912 the Titanic reached Southampton, England, from where it was to embark on its maiden voyage across the ocean. The very first sight of the Titanic took everyone's breath away. It's time to take a closer look at the ship in detail. In short, the Titanic was an improved Olympic. It was only 8 centimeters longer than its twin. And the total tonnage, 1,000 tons more. As we said, it was the largest ship in the world at the time. The liner had a total of 8 decks. Simply put, 8 floors with ceiling heights from 2.5 to 3 meters. But not all of them were located along the entire length of the ship. There were only four such decks. The numbering of the decks was not in the usual order from bottom to top, but on the contrary from top to bottom. The topmost deck was the deck with davits, without a number, and below it were the decks A, B, C, and so on. Up to the letter G. This information will be needed further to understand who was where and who fled from where at the time of the tragedy. Below the Davits deck was the 150-meter-long A deck. Almost all of it was for first-class passengers only. There were 34 cabins, and many miscellaneous rooms, for noble ladies and gentlemen. Reading rooms. Smoking lounges. Lounges. Below on B deck, in addition to 97 deluxe cabins, was a French restaurant with meals for the wealthiest passengers. There was also a separate unobstructed promenade area forward of the B deck, which was open to second and third class passengers. In general, the lower the deck, the less space and more poor people. The ship's crew was housed mainly on decks B and D. They had separate gangways so that they could occupy their workplaces without having to pass by the passenger cabins. Incidentally, in addition to lounges and restaurants, the Titanic had Turkish baths, a swimming pool, a ballroom, a gymnasium, and many other amenities. Many claim that while some sailed in incredible luxury, others were in tiny cabins in darkness and without any amenities. Well, let's see if it was. Of course, 
the conditions of the third class were noticeably worse than those of the first and second classes. But these conditions did not compare favorably with the conditions under which third-class people had to sail in the late 19th century. On the Titanic, all living quarters were well ventilated, heated, and lit by electric light. It had its own smoking lounge, lounge area, spacious restaurant and promenade decks with tables and chairs where you could hang out in all weathers. The food was simple but of good quality. Many poor people who traveled on this liner in search of a new homeland admitted after 24 hours that they had never had such an abundance of food in their lives. That said, the ticket price was quite reasonable, costing only a few pounds. Of course, on the part of White Star Line, it was not charity. They calculated everything very precisely. No shipping company could survive in the market if it only transported millionaires. So, they purposely made good conditions for poor passengers so that they would recommend their company's particular ship to other people for sailing. In fact, it was the hundreds of third-class passengers who were White Star Line's main source of profit. But let's get to something even more interesting. So, safety. The Titanic's unsinkability was ensured by 16 watertight bulkheads that covered the entire hold. They rose from the second bottom and went up four or even five decks above. All the bulkheads were so strong that they had to withstand the strong pressure that could be caused by a hull breach. The first three bulkheads were solid, all others had sealed doors that allowed crew and passengers to move between compartments of the ship. Important feature. All doors between bulkheads could be closed manually or remotely. In the event of a sudden collision, this significantly increased the ship's chance of staying afloat. There was a hatch in the ceiling of each compartment that led to the topmost deck with lifeboats. In case of danger, those who had not had time to leave before the section door closed could climb through it. All in all, these 16 bulkheads seemed to reliably protect the vessel's vertical tightness. And how was the horizontal tightness ensured? And there it was worse. Only one deck could guarantee water tightness, and the rest of the decks were not airtight, they had a lot of hatches, ladders and shafts, including lifts, through which water could penetrate into any compartment and reach the upper decks A and B. Despite this shortcoming, the Titanic's design was considered quite robust. It could easily stay afloat if any two compartments were flooded and should not sink even if the first four were damaged. At the time, it seemed to be almost a 100% safety guarantee. No one allowed the idea that in the event of an accident, water could penetrate into more rooms. The English shipbuilding magazine, Shipbuilder, called the Titanic virtually unsinkable. It is a huge palace on the water, which is not afraid of storms or icebergs. The power of its steam engines reached 55,000 horsepower, and its maximum speed was 25 knots, i.e. about 45 kilometers per hour. In accordance with outdated regulations, the Titanic was equipped with 20 lifeboats, with a total capacity of 1,178 people, which was only a third of the steamer's maximum capacity. On the morning of Wednesday the 10th of April, 1912, a special White Star Line campaign train was brought to Platform 12 at London's largest station. The platform was packed with people who had chosen the huge, gleaming new Titanic to travel across the ocean on its maiden voyage. The attention of journalists was attracted by the tall figure of John Jacob Aestia, he was not just a millionaire, but a billionaire. One of the richest men in the world. He was considered a brilliant idler, on whom fell a huge fortune as an inheritance. Aestia lived in a luxurious estate, in the garage of which stood several samples of the new miracle of technology, cars. A year ago Aestia had broken all the proprieties of the time, he had divorced and remarried an 18-year-old girl who was even younger than his son. The newlyweds decided to spend the winter in a foreign country until the scandal was settled in the United States. And so a few months later, they were returning home. Another man waiting for the train to dock with the Titanic was Benjamin Guggenheim of the clan of the successful mining magnate Meyer Guggenheim, they owned a vast empire of mines and smelters. 
In the other group of passengers was banker Isidore Strauss. Not far away, George Widener, the heir and right-hand man of the largest American tram magnate and the richest man in Philadelphia, was chatting animatedly. Together with his wife and son Harry, a collector of rare editions, he was returning from a holiday on the Riviera. Two officers were also preparing to board the train, Major Archibald Butt, President Taft's aide-de-camp, and Colonel Archibald Gracie, a wealthy man who had spent the last few years working on a book about the American Civil War. We're not listing all these names by accident. It is so that you can understand the significance of those people who were on the Titanic in first class. They all represented the cream of the crop of society in the passing, golden age, of American capitalism, as Mark Twain defined it. All of them soon find themselves tragically captured by the cold ocean. But for now they are merrily preparing for a comfortable voyage in pleasant company, on the biggest and most expensive ship. For which they have already paid a great deal of money. But there were also those who abandoned the voyage at the last minute. First of all, of course, J.P. Morgan himself. He was at the ceremony of sending Titanic to the campaign and was even going to cross the Atlantic Ocean on it. But he fell ill and on the advice of doctors, instead of America he went to France for treatment. Due to illness, Lord William James Peary, president of the Harland and Wolf shipyard that built the Titanic, withdrew from the maiden voyage. For unknown reasons, financial tycoon Alfred Vanderbilt and his wife did not board the ship. But his valet and maid and luggage were on the ship. A few days later, they all drowned together. In Southampton, at a hotel near the harbour, spent the last night before the opening, shipyard director Thomas Andrews and general manager Joseph Bruce's May were both due to take part in the maiden voyage of the ship, they had put so much effort into building. The time before sailing was used by passengers and escorts to view this marvel of shipbuilding. Already at the first sight, being near this giant, people's breath was taken away. Especially those who came from villages and small towns in Europe and now many of them were holding a third-class ticket in their hand. They could not hide their amazement, admiration, and fear. And we're not just making up pretty words as we go along. That's exactly what the newspapers said on the day of sailing. But to be fair, they had a lot to be surprised about. The Titanic had a lot to be surprised about, size, interior decoration, modern technologies, design, and so on. Third-class passengers had to be examined by the ship's doctor before boarding the ship. This was required by American immigrant laws. And if a person showed signs of any dangerous infectious disease, he was sent back to shore, while the others were escorted to their cabins. The tickets were labeled with the numbers of the cabins and their beds, so the whole procedure was quick and uncomplicated. A total of 1,500 passengers and thousands of curious bystanders were in joyous excitement before the Titanic set sail. And what did the first-class passengers, for example, see when they got on the ship for the first time? A wide staircase took them down to the first-class rooms, entering the interior of the ship from the dinghy deck. At the top of the stairs, a large clock was built into the expensive walnut wall. An impressive glass dome towered over the entire staircase and those who did not want to go down the stairs could use the silent electric lifts that ran almost the entire height of the ship. On a deck, in addition to the reading room and smoking lounge, you could admire the lounge and the winter garden. The Titanic had its own greenhouse. On the B deck, the millionaire suites attracted special attention. With its own promenade deck. Each cabin was equipped differently. They included two bedrooms, a living room, a bathroom, a hallway. The cabins, instead of the usual round portholes, were fitted with large windows, as in a palace. Instead of steam heating radiators, coal-fired fireplaces were installed. Furniture, interior of cabins were designed by the best artists and designers of the time. But that's not all. There was a telephone in all first-class cabins.
and engineers also took into account, at the request of those keen on the fashionable hobby of car ownership, a special crane. It could lift the car from the PA and place it in the luggage compartment of the ship, so that its owner would not part with his favorite toy in another country. Care was also taken for those passengers who might need medical assistance during the voyage. Instead of the usual ship's medical station, there was a perfectly equipped hospital with an operating theater. We suggest you get to know the main person on any ship, the captain. Here he is, Edward John Smith standing and signing the report that the ship is loaded and ready to sail. The engines and boilers are in working order. This 62-year-old broad-shouldered man with a gray beard and a pleasant, quiet voice demanded iron discipline from the crew. But at the same time he was universally loved, thanks to his tact and sense of humor. One met the opinion that Smith's appointment as captain of the Titanic was a mistake. The argument was that he was old, not long for retirement, and in general that he was a bad manager. But in reality Edward John Smith was, at that time, the most experienced and best-known captain sailing in the North Atlantic. He gave the impression of absolute reliability with his whole appearance. He was always respected and trusted by every crew, on every ship. White Star Line had the same confidence in him. Edward John Smith worked there for 32 years, captaining 17 ships, including the Olympic, which we have already mentioned. He rose to the rank of company commodore, the highest officer rank. He was the highest paid captain in the British Merchant Navy. And his salary was as much as 30% more than the second highest paid captain on the ship. White Star Line always entrusted Edward John Smith with the best of its ships on their first voyages. That is why Joseph Bruce Ismay suggested that it was Captain Edward John Smith who stood on the captain's bridge of the Titanic on its maiden voyage. Although he was already eligible to retire. Commanding the largest passenger ship in the world, in a triumphant voyage on the transatlantic line, was to complete a long and successful career as a captain. This voyage was to be his last. But in the end it turned out that way. The main thing we wanted to say is that Edward John Smith was the logical and only candidate for the captaincy of the Titanic from the very beginning. But was everything so perfect with the crew of the ship Titanic? Most of the mechanics, sailors and stokers came to work on the Titanic a week before the first voyage. This was too short a period of time to get used to the ship and orientate themselves properly. The situation was also complicated by a major miners' strike, which took place at the very moment when the Titanic was due to embark on its first voyage. And the coal shortage affected all the major shipping companies. White Star Line was no exception. The Titanic had 159 coal furnaces that required 650 tons of coal a day. Where to get that amount when coal was no longer mined at all? But White Star Line found a way out. They cancelled the scheduled voyages of their other ships and sent all the coal from them to the Titanic. But even that wasn't enough. So the company was forced to buy some of the fuel from American ships. Well, since the voyages of other White Star Line ships were cancelled, the company managers thought, why should their sailors be idle? So they quickly decided to transfer them to the Titanic as well. These sailors felt uncomfortable and confused on the huge ship. Many of them had only boarded the liner for the first time on the day of sailing. Until then, they had no idea what the ship they were to work on looked like or what duties they would have to fulfill. Many of them did not even know each other. In general, before the ship's maiden voyage, only a fraction of the crew knew how to operate something as grand as the Titanic. These were the few who had already worked on Olympic. The upshot of all this then was that at the critical moment, not all crew members knew what to do. Subscribe to A Boom Story and don't forget to like it. If you want more incredible stories like this one. By doing this you are not only thanking the author, but also reminding the YouTube algorithm that you like videos with similar themes, and that you can train the artificial intelligence to recommend you other authors who compose videos on similar topics.